Hey, advanced procrastinators, welcome back. Uh, today's episode will be about the end of the civil rights movement. And today we're going to be looking at how the civil rights movement by the 1960s, though it was well established and was making a lot of gains and achievements, students can identify peoples and groups within the movement that were dissatisfied with the progress and the direction of the movement by the mid 60s. Students are also going to analyze why the movement ended around 1970 and evaluate how successful the civil rights movement was in achieving the goal of equality for all Americans. Now, a major problem that was happening about the 1960s is that a lot of people felt the civil rights movement was taking too long and too many people were getting hurt. A lot of people wanted to take a more radical, confrontational, and violent route. Basically, Martin Luther King's non-confrontation, peaceful protests were the Christian idea of turning the other cheek was getting really tired to people after about 10 years of getting hit in the cheek. And they're thinking, how many more times am I going to hit in the face? And also, maybe the next time someone hits me in the face, I'm going to hit them back. You also have problems in cities of economic and social injustice happening. The, the problems of economic poverty with a lot of African Americans, as well as the problems with police violence. And that's the problem with the Watts riots that sets up in Los Angeles, which was amongst the largest riots in American history up to this point. Now, in Los Angeles, those Los Angeles doesn't have segregation, the, the, there are major confrontations between the white police force and the black population. Basically, the white police force's mentality was to be a paramilitary organization to keep down minorities in Los Angeles. So rather than protecting and serving, they were really enforcing and controlling minorities within the city. And the incidents that sets up this riot is when a white policeman arrests an African-American for drunk driving. And rather than letting the brother drive the young African-American home, there becomes a whole confrontation on the street between the, the drunk African-American and the police, and it starts escalating as more neighbors come out they, they do not like the fact that this young man is going to be arrested. Again, just seems to be another example of another um, unfair conflict between the two groups. And the riots, riots break out. It's a six-day riot. 34 people die. 3,500 arrests. 900 people injured. $30 million destroyed. And this is in Los Angeles. This is not in the South. This is in the third largest city in the United States at this time. And the home of Hollywood, a, a city that people thought was idyllic. And the outcome is there's going to be more race riots in over 100 cities, and there's going to be new leaders that are going to emerge in the civil rights movement after these riots. Now, the first question to answer here, guys, is think about this. Even though L.A. does not have segregation like the South, right, what problems would African-Americans in the North have to deal with and they want solved? Take a moment to stop the video and answer the question. <clears throat> and the answer to this question is basically, Yes, there is no de facto segregation saying where black people are supposed to live and have to live and where they can go and they can't go. But there are certainly economic problems uh, for African-Americans of poverty, of the inability to find a good job. And then, as we just mentioned earlier, police brutality is a reality for African-Americans in the North, as if it would be the problem in maybe the Klan in the South. So one of these new leaders that comes out of this is going to be Malcolm X. Now, Malcolm X was originally born Malcolm Little, uh, and he was a bit of a punk as a kid, and he was jailed for burglary when he was 20 years old. Now, it was in prison that he turned to a the Muslim faith uh, within America called the Nation of Islam. Now, one is, analyze why some African Americans moved away from Christianity and might want to become Muslims instead of being good Christians like Martin Luther King. Stop the video, answer the question. And an answer to this is, is basically a lot of African Americans are thinking, why are we going to be part of the same religion as the group that is fighting against us? A lot of my students have always asked, why does a KKK burn crosses? Like that's really, that's their religion too. And that's kind of the, exactly the point. Why are we part of a religion that is basically controlled by white people rather than maybe religion, Islam, which is a more colored religion and has always had a history in Africa as well as the Middle East. Now, two ideas you need to know about the nation of Islam within the United States is their view is whites are the cause of all African-American problems. 
So what African Americans do is live separately from whites and take care of themselves, form separate communities within the United States where they will not rely on whites to help blacks. A second one is rather than Martin Luther King's non-peaceful protests, they believe that blacks have a right to self-defense if they're attacked by whites. So this is a group that is preaching, we will fight back if people are confrontational to us. Now, analyze, how are whites and moderate Christian African-Americans like Martin Luther King going to respond to Malcolm X's message? Answer that. Go ahead and stop the video. And the answer is, this scared the heck out of people. The idea of a group of African-Americans that are dedicated to fighting back. Two things to keep in mind is that a lot of African-American leaders like Martin Luther King, right, are afraid that blacks fighting back, if they do, will be the one thing that the press focuses on as if the whole problem is with black people. The second one is if blacks do fight back, we could have a race war in the United States and this would escalate to new levels. Now, the thing about Malcolm X that stands out, too, is that he was a charismatic speaker and a charismatic personality, right? And he starts becoming more famous in the nation of Islam. He's not the head of the nation, nation of Islam. He's just a spokesperson for them. Um, Elijah Muhammad is, is the, the head of the nation of Islam, right? And some examples of this is you can see in the image, uh, middle image on the top, right? He became very close friends with Cassius Clay. And Cassius Clay was the heavyweight champion of the world. And he obviously changes his name to Muhammad Ali. And this is a huge achievement for the nation of Islam so, because basically Muhammad Ali was the most famous athlete on the planet at this time. His teachings are also going to help inspire Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Lua Cinder at UCLA and with the Milwaukee Book, Bucks, to also convert to Islam after Malcolm X's death. Now, what ends up happening with Malcolm X is his race philosophy starts to change. He does not stay as radical and being separated. He takes a Hajj to, Me to Mecca, as all Muslims are supposed to do. And when he gets there, he recognizes that Islam is not a minority or a dark-skinned religion. It is a human religion. And all religions preach the goodness of people in general, right? So he starts accepting racial equality and peaceful protests as Islamic views shared by Christian views. Now, when he does this, he leaves the nation of Islam and starts preaching racial solidarity. And actually, now he's talking about voting, whereas the nation of Islam did not want to be a part of democratic process. He's assassinated by the nation of Islam in 1965. Now, this is a big question. Imagine how the civil rights movement could have been different if Malcolm X had lived past 1965 and been around after Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. Think about that. The answer to this question is, if I were to ask you before the, the lecture started, how many civil rights leaders do you know, you probably would have said Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. After that, you might know a couple more. But the question is this, who takes over the civil rights movement after Martin Luther King? When he's assassinated, who becomes the head of the civil rights movement? The answer is no one. There was no one there who was as charismatic as Martin Luther King and had a vision and a message. And had Martin, Malcolm X been alive after Martin Luther King had been assassinated, there might have been a person who had the power to continue the civil rights movement uh, beyond just creating fair laws and going into the social inequalities uh, within the African American community. And with this, we get another group within the civil rights movement, the Black Power Movement. Now, this is a new generation of younger African Americans by the 1960s, right, that want to embrace the racial difference as a positive. Unlike trying to fit in, they're saying, look, we're different and being different is good. So they grow their hair long, they celebrate their African roots, they demand African American studies at universities, right? Now, the, the creator of this concept of black power is Stokely Carmichael. Now, he is the leader of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, okay? And he's the one who coined the phrase black power after being arrested during the March Against Fear. Now, in the right-hand corner there, you guys can see James Meredith, who was the first African-American who attended the University of Mississippi, which caused a whole riot. Well, two years later, he starts a 220-mile solitary march uh, for equality in Mississippi, and he doesn't want it to be hijacked or led by civil rights leaders. He just wants to be a very generic, spontaneous 
March that gets popularity. He's shot, you can see right there, uh, on the second day, but he lived. The uh, assailant was hiding in the woods and shot him with a shotgun in his legs. Now what happens is after James Meredith is shot, all three major civil rights organizations, SNCC with Carmichael, SLC with Martin Luther King, and CORE with Andrew McKiss, they finished the march. And it's on this march that they, they're confronted by the police a lot of times, and they are hit and beaten and abused and arrested. And by the end of it, you have the nonviolent techniques of Martin Luther King, and then you have more confrontational techniques with Carmichael, where Carmichael basically says, I've been arrested, I've been beaten, and I want us to stand out. I'm tired of being hit now, right? And you know what? If we're going to wait on white people to give us our equality, we're never going to get it. We have to go out on our own and get it ourselves. And that's a question. Should white people be an integral part of the civil rights movement? Answer that question. Stop the video. Now, those who say yes, you can come from the point of view, it's America. We're all Americans. We all share this nation, right? The Declaration of Independence, it says all people are created equal. So you're bringing in all Americans as one group. You could also say another one, we're a democracy. Of course, you have to bring in white people. They're the majority voters. And when they vote, they will make a difference. They make the laws or they help to elect the politicians who will make the laws that will protect African Americans. But black power activists on the other side are saying, no. We're waiting for something that's never going to come. We need, if anybody wants to get anything in life, you got to go out on your own and you've got to get it yourself. And as a group, African Americans need to do the exact same thing. Another group that's going to come out in this more confrontational civil rights movement is the infamous Black, Black Panther Party, the BBP. Now, it starts in 1965 in Oakland, California. Now, notice, look where the civil rights movement is leaving. In previous lectures I've mentioned, it's in the South. We're talking about Mississippi. We're talking about Alabama, right? Now, we mentioned the Watts riots. Now, we're in Oakland, California. Yes, the Black Panther Party is founded in Oakland, California. Now, why is the civil rights movement moved to California where there is no Jim Crow? Stop. Answer the question. And the answer to this is basically you're dealing with issues of, uh, as I said, social and economic inequality, of poverty, and police brutality as well, too. So what's it, what's did the Black Panthers do to try to confront these issues of economic inequality and police brutality? They arm themselves, right? They preach armed revolution and they openly carried guns. Remember, the Second Amendment says you have a right to a gun, especially a, a regulated militia to protect people from the government. And that's what their point of view is. So you evaluate. Do you feel the BBP, the Black Panther Party has a right to carry guns and confront the police. And basically, if you're a NRA activist today, they would say absolutely Americans have the right to defend themselves from bad government. And it's the police that's a representative of government. If the government's job is to protect your life, liberty, and property, and the police aren't doing that, people need to do it themselves. Now, Another thing about, about the Black Panther Party is they were not a terrorist organization, right? They were actually doing lots of charity work at the same time. They had breakfast programs, they had daycare, they had other services as well too, right? So they were a commu community organization de dedicated to helping the people within the community. Now, another thing that makes them stand out was their style. They wore black berets, they wore leather jackets, they wore sunglasses. And think about this for one second. Why do you think style was so important to the success of the Black Panther Party? They started in Oakland and they spread nationally, quickly. Why? Stop and think about that for a second. The answer to the question is, is this. Imagine you're a young person who's 18, 19 years old. You don't have much to do. You want to be a part of something, right? Oh, my God. Look at this group. They look good. They're confident, they're confrontational, they got guns. Now, a lot of people today would say, hey, that could just be a regular gangster, right? They have their own style, they have their own group, and they also carry guns, and they, they've got it going on. The only difference here is I get to be a part of a group that's trying to make positive change for my community, right? So it has all the same attributes, attributes of maybe 
a disaffected youth wanting to join a street gang. But the difference is rather than joining a street gang, they're joining a gang that is bringing positive good, they feel. Now, what ends up happening to the Black Panther Party is a lot of incidences uh, make them make the public view them as a terrorist group. Uh, there were police shootouts with, there were shootouts with the police, obviously, when you're carrying guns. Ronald Reagan passed for the Mulford Act that banned carrying firearms in public in California as a governor of California. Uh, the problem with it, there's also the Black Panther Party, is there were criminal elements within the Black Panther Party. Some of the organizations were involved in criminal activities like drug dealing. The other problem is you might have had ex-felons that are in the Black Panther Party headquarters and whatnot, and you can carry a gun. You just can't be a felon and carry a gun, right? And then the FBI had Pro investigations. These are illegal investigations where the FBI was investigating groups within the United States that they thought were a threat to America. These are the same investigations where the FBI was investigating secretly Martin Luther King, and they were doing the same thing with the Black Panther Party. And these all these together started discrediting the organization to the public. Now, Chicanos. They also, in the late 60s, start making themselves known too. And besides the same concerns with African Americans regarding race and economic discrimination, right? Latinos also have other concerns, which is the acceptance of language in their schools. In a lot of schools in California or Texas, it was it was a school rule to not speak Spanish. You could literally get in trouble for speaking Spanish as if you were graffiti on the wall. And also the issue of immigration. Now, two of the most famous civil rights leaders for Hispanics are Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Uh, they are both the founders of the United Farm Workers Movement. And the idea with the farm workers is farm laborers are amongst the lowest paid people in the United States. We have a minimum wage, but farm laborers don't even have that minimum wage because the idea is, hey, they're immigrants, they're, they're tra transient, they move from place to place. If they don't want the job, they won't come out. So what Chavez and Huerta do is they unionize the farm laborers. And one of the ways they got gained their attention was through a nationwide boycott of grapes demanding better pay. In fact, Cesar Chavez goes on a hunger strike for 28 days to in an effort to win signed contracts with the farm industry recognizing the UFW. And that is Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, sitting down breaking bread with Cesar Chavez when he broke his fast. Now, think about this for one second. Grapes. What's the power of grapes? Why did why did the UFW say we're going to boycott grapes? Why not oranges? Why not, you know, uh, rice or cotton or other products grown in California, right? Why do they focus on grapes? Think about that for one second. And the answer to this is it's not because grapes are yummy. In fact, I was at the market yesterday and my wife said, hey, those grapes look good. I said, no, I don't need the grapes. We're not going to get them today. Grapes are used for wine. And in California, in the late 60s, early 70s, the wine industry is starting to become internationally recognized as a major wine producing area outside of France. And by boycotting grapes meant that the wine industry was being affected by that. Now, there's also a more radical movement, the Brown Berets and Chicano movement happening at the same time. Now, this is inspired by younger Latinos demanding bilingual education and the creation of Chicano studies programs similar to the Black Power Movement, right? In fact, you have the La Raza, uh, which was founded in Texas in 1970 as a third political party, right, uh, for Hispanics to create political unity. Now, the question here is, analyze, why is the Democratic Party not doing enough to represent the needs of Mexican-American voters? It's the Democratic Party that is the party that's supposed to represent uh, ordinary people and, and, and the workers and laborers and whatnot. And why do you think Hispanics are frustrated with the lack of gains by the Democratic Party. Stop it and think about that. Now, the answer to that is there's a couple reasons. Number one, Mexican Americans are not that large of a political group yet. They're really only in California and Texas at that time, right? So they're not spread around America and they're certainly not like today where. Hispanics or Latinos are the second largest ethnic group in America with about 12 or 14 percent of the population. That's one problem. A second problem is the Democratic Party's focus on two other things happen at the same time. One, African-Americans. 
African-American civil rights movement is at the forefront. So the Democrats are fighting for African-American rights, not focusing on Chicano rights. And a third thing that's starting to happen this time is also Vietnam. Vietnam has taken a lot of attention away from a lot of things happening in America, and people aren't focused on Chicano rights or even noticing them. They're focused on Vietnam and what's happening on television every night with people being shot. Now, another incident in the Chicano movement is the East L.A. student walkouts, right? Um, now, in East L.A., right, Hispanics had amongst the worst schools in Los Angeles, right? Garfield and Roosevelt High School had the highest dropout rates in LAUSD. We're talking about 50% dropout rate. Half of all students dropped out of high school, right? Um, and the students walked out demanding smaller class sizes. Class sizes were well over 40 to 1 with, with amongst the worst teachers in Los Angeles. They wanted a bilingual education or the opportunity to speak Spanish in school, especially for kids who are recent immigrants, right? And a, cur a curriculum that documented Chicano contributions to the United States. So the students, backed by the Brown Berets, inspired by them, walked out. So what I want you guys to do is watch this video about Sal Castro and the 1968 East LA walkouts. It's a bit of Los Angeles history that people do not talk about. Um, and I want you to answer these three questions. Um, identify two educational restrictions that Mexican American students face in school. Number 12, uh, identify two legal challenges or confrontations or dangers that you're gonna see that these students uh, had to face um, during or after the walkouts. And lastly, even though this incident's often overlooked, I mean, you've probably never heard of this before until you watch this right now. Evaluate the impact and success this walkout has had on the life of young Latinos today. Contrast the difference in education opportunity for young Latino students today compared with the 1960s. So uh, Google in uh, South Castro in the 1968 East LA walkouts, watch the video, and then come back to me again. Stop the video and go find that now. Now, the end of the civil rights movement. Well, basically, we'll start from here. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated April 3rd, 1968 by James Earl Ray. Um, he was in Memphis, Tennessee, not to end segregation or anything like that. He's actually changed his civil rights outlook to helping economic inequality. And he was starting a strike for the sanitation workers in Memphis, not just black sanitation workers, but all sanitation workers. Right now, the reaction to this is it's the worst riots in American history. 105 cities just go on fire. Right. And just think about this. Why was Martin Luther King so important in the civil rights movement? I mean, who's going to take up the mantle of civil rights after MLK? And that's kind of what we said here. here. He was a national figure, not a figure within a group of people. Right. Like like Stokely Carmichael and Black Power or Malcolm X was with the Nation of Islam. Right. He was someone that all Americans actually looked at and admired. And who's going to take over? There's nobody. So basically, after his death, by about 1970, the civil rights movement essentially stops, even though discrimination and prejudice still exists in America even today. So think about this. Analyze. Why did the civil rights movement lose steam and it ends even though the goals were not achieved? Stop for a second and think about that. Now, there's a couple of reasons why it ends. So you can pick one of these and write these down. The first one is actually a lot of the major goals at the very beginning were achieved. Uh, Jim Crow laws were ended. That's the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Voting rights were established. That's the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Blacks can now vote. They have political participation. There were laws written in that protected civil rights now, right? You also have something else happening in America is a rising black middle class working good factory jobs in the Rust Belt areas, right? These African-Americans that have moved north to areas like Gary, Indiana, right, are finding themselves with good factory paying jobs just like white Americans, and they're making a decent living. So they're they're living the middle class lifestyle for something. And you also have an acceptance of black culture, black popular culture by the 1970s. Contrast the 50s where on television it was only white America. And by the 1970s, R&B, hip hop, disco, music was very, very much, you know, you, black artists were all over music, right? On television, there's gonna be a lot of shows in the 1970s about the black life, like it could be the Jeffersons or Good Times or the White Shadow and whatnot. In film, you also have filmed with African-American stars in them there. And by the 70s too, in sports, African-Americans are everywhere. And this is the one part in American society where people 
don't look at people based on race. They just want their team to win. And if your team had a bunch of black players on it, those are my guys. I like those guys. So there's a lot of acceptance of blacks within America at this time. Second one, as we mentioned, <clears throat> a lot of leaders moved on. I mean, Martin Luther King is dead. Malcolm X is dead. Edgar Members, an NC NC2A activist, is dead, right? Um, Stokely Carmichael, he just went up and left to Africa. He's like, it's never going to happen in America, so I'm going to go to Africa. And other ones like John Lewis, the the leader of the Bloody Sunday, the protest of Bloody Sunday, right, at and Selma, at Edmund Pettus Bridge. He's going to be elected into Congress eventually. And same with Hosea Williams, who was one of Martin Luther King's activists or key, key leaders. Uh, you also have Thurgood Marshall, who becomes a Supreme Court justice in 1967. So they don't need to be civil rights activists. They now become politicians. Also, ordinary citizens, white and black, are kind of tired of this. It's been 15 years of promoting change and getting confrontation and stuff like that. And, and a lot of people are this time like, let's just get on with our life, you know? And also Vietnam, that's going to be a big one. By 1968, when Martin Luther King is assassinated, this is the height of the Vietnam War and the Tet Offensive is going to happen. And Americans' attention is going to move away from equality and equal rights for one minority group to why are we ha halfway around the world and Americans are dying on television for to stop the spread of communism. Maybe we need to focus our attention on ending the Vietnam War. And that's where a lot of the young young youth's attention goes to, not civil rights anymore, like in Freedom Summer, but to the hippie movement. So what are the real achievements of civil rights, the civil rights movement? Well, de facto segregation by law is over. There's no more Jim Crow. Jim Crow. But de jure segregation by custom is still in America today. That is one of the biggest misses of the civil rights movement is all segregation in America was not end. I mean, just stop and think. How is segregation still evident in schools today? Stop and think about that. And the answer is, right, I mean, even today in Los Angeles, right, schools are not segregated by law, white and black schools, but they're segregated economically. You go to the school that's in your local community, and if you live in Manhattan Beach, you go to Miracosta. If you live in Palos Verdes, you go to Palos Verdes. If you live in Compton, you go to Compton. And and the, the schools are made up of the, are made up of the people that live in the local community, right? So that's basically how it's evident today. And there is not a mixing of the races. Now, in the late seventies, you can see there's a picture there in the middle of a guy with an American flag attacking an African American. There was an attempt to try to end this de jure segregation in schools called busing where they were going to forcibly have whites go to black schools and blacks go to white schools on buses every single day and you can see from that image uh, how popular that was for a lot of white americans to have their kids sent to an inner city school to go to school with minorities right but remember legislative wise the civil rights act of 1964 and 68 ends discrimination in public places you have the voting rights act african americans vote and this is probably one of the most important lasting legacy of the civil rights movement, these. Just think, identify two examples of the impact of African-American political participation in U.S. government and politics today. Stop and think if you can think of two. Stop it. And obviously, here's one, Barack Obama, right? First black president of the United States. We've gone in 50 years from blacks not being able to vote to the leader of America being an African-American. Now, there's still unfinished work. Evaluate if the civil rights movement achieved its goals and equality for up opportunity, right? Now, as we mentioned, in the 70s, civil rights did not solve the more difficult issues of poor housing, unemployment, poverty, poor education, and subliminal racism. Those still exist. Now, an attempt to try to fix that is called affirmative action. And what happens here is their quotas or setting aside a number of spaces for minorities meant to get into universities or government jobs, right? This was meant to make up for the injustices of the past and allow a group of hardworking minorities to move up economically. So stop and think about this. Should a number of spaces be set aside to minorities at universities to allow more minorities the opportunity to get into college? So say if UCLA has an incoming class of 10,000 students a year, a guaranteed number of, say, 800, because of African-Americans, about 8% of the population in California, 
uh, and a guaranteed number of 3,000 for Hispanics, as they're about 30% of California, right? So a guaranteed number of 3,800 places for African Americans and Hispanics, guaranteed based on the highest grades amongst those groups, and then the rest of the places open, right? So even though their grades and skill levels might be lower than other applicants, should a certain number of spots be left aside? So think about that. Now, the two sides of this is, I know a lot of you probably said, absolutely not, right? You get in based on your skill and your hard work, and if somebody has worked less hard than I have or does not have the grades that I have, they should not get in over instead of me, right? Um, and that is the obvious reason why affirmative action, people are against it. But other people would say, well, a problem would be is a lot of those people who are getting in based on their grades have other advantages, right? You might've gone to a better school. You might've had a tutor. You might've had parents that know what they're doing, you know, um, as well as the fact that, you know, in a lot of these jobs, we're not like being a fireman. You know, I had a friend that tried to become a fireman and they said, no, we're not going to hire white people right now. Now that was unfair to him, even though he was number one in his fireman class. But at the same time, the LAFD at the time was 96% white. So you have to think how many Hispanics or African Americans were never allowed an opportunity to become firemen before that. And there was a need to maybe catch up on that number. Now, the Supreme Court case, right, uh, that deals with this is Bakke versus UC Regents. And in this, it ruled that the universities, Bakke was trying to get into medical school at UC Davis, and he did not get in, even though he had better grades than other minority recipients uh, or minority ex students who were accepted to the medical school. And it ruled that a university's use of racial quotas and its admissions process was unconstitutional. But a school's use of affirmative action uh, to accept more minority applicants was constitutional in some circumstances. You can do it in some certain circumstances, but not in general. You just can't say, look, there's a thousand spots that are set aside, you know. Uh, and this is an issue that California needs to deal with because should a school look like a UCLA or whatnot look like uh, the makeup of the state in general, or should it be based solely on who gets in? Because at UCLA right now, it's about 40% plus Asian, about high 30s white, uh, and I believe Sometimes at UCLA, the entering freshman class of African Americans at UCLA, which has 10,000 people, is literally in the low hundreds of African Americans being accepted. So do you want to go to a school or should the schools in California look more like the population of the state? All right, guys. Thank you very much and have a good day.